Yes. Yeah. Hi everyone and welcome to the uh, Boca School of Coffee Boca broadcast. Um, since um, some of us are stuck at home and not everyone can uh, uh, can go everywhere, we thought it would be nice to answer some of your questions um, uh, while you're sitting at home. So uh, what we're going to do is we have uh, sort of a small hour and uh, we're going to make some coffee, maybe. Uh, I'm going to try and answer some questions. We already had some uh, cool questions in the mail. and. Um, uh, if you're watching and you have some, uh, I'll try to keep, uh, to keep everyone's questions uh, uh, um, updated as much as possible. Um, let me know if you uh, have any um, specific requests. If I didn't ask your questions enough, you can always email us at workshop at and uh, we're going to save this broadcast uh, so you can watch it later if you don't have the chance. Right, so um, hi everyone. <laughs> Hi Nino, uh, hi Eru, uh, thank you very much. Um, I uh, first want to go through uh, two uh, questions that we had in the mail, uh, which are interesting questions and the questions that I know that a lot of people are struggling with. And the first one uh, is a pretty simple one. Um, Valentina uh, is stuck at home and she said, uh, I have a uh, French press. How do I make a nice French press? Now, um, me making a French press right now uh, won't be particularly interesting because I'm just gonna grind and put some hot water on it. But it's, I do have an air press here to explain a little bit about it. Uh, sorry, a French press. Um, I really like French press because it's really convenient and uh, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to, uh, uh, to do, especially if you have some people in your living room that you need to cater to or pay, pay, pay some attention to. Um, and uh, Fantine asked, like, how do I make a good uh, French press? And I think that uh, uh, part of that is um, that uh, how do you make good coffee is a question we get really general. And there's a couple things that are universal in making coffee. And uh, the first one is that we always suggest is get some good coffee. Um, making coffee with a French press isn't really different from making coffee uh, in any other way, it's putting coffee in contact with water and the stuff that you're using is most important. Also, when you're cooking, uh, the, the, the pan that you're cooking in isn't the most important or the type of oven that you use isn't the most important. What's the most important is to get the good ingredients. Now, coffee is the main ingredient and getting some good coffee is the most important. Um, if someone wants to know later, um, we, can, uh, we can go into like what is good coffee because that's like, a really long question. But let's go back to French press. So first you get some good coffee and then um, what's important is that uh, you um, get some good water as well. I have a question coming up uh, about water quality, so I'm gonna get into that later. But if you have good coffee and good water, uh, you can start brewing. Now, um, the amazing thing about the French press is that you just, <laughs> is that you uh, just have a vessel where you put in some coffee and then put in some water and then just wait. Um, what a lot of people say is, um, what people say in the past is that you brew it for like four minutes and your water has to be like 20, 92 kind of degrees. Um, I would just use boiling water and um, uh, use boiling water and then steep it for at least like six, seven minutes. And after that, uh, there's sort of a crust on top and you can either scoop that off, but if you, uh, if you have some people in your living room that uh, really want some attention, you uh, can just uh, use this as a sieve to, uh, to make sure that the coffee is stopped before it comes out of your, uh, your, um, your vessel. Um, don't put it all the way down, because if you put it all the way down, uh, the residue at the bottom is can sort of steep through because especially if you have some more coffee uh, um, in your uh, in your vessel and you plunge it too hard some of those finer the smaller parts of the coffee can sort of get through the filter because most especially the cheaper uh, uh, french press are pretty good but not super good so it's important to not disturb the coffee grounds too much Right, so you just you use boiling water straight up the boil. Uh, when you throw it in there, the temperature is immediately gonna uh, uh, like um, go down to like 93 degrees. So you don't have to worry about um, doing too much like damage. Then um, 
as in how much coffee you use, uh, generally uh, sort of an average is 60 grams per liter. So I usually, for my, for my family, I usually make like half a liter, so that's 30 grams of coffee for half a liter water. Um, that sounds very specific. Um, I always make coffee using a skill, a digital skill, um, because that allows me to replicate my methods. Um, imagine you're cooking and you, uh, you made some delicious and you want to replicate it, but you don't know how much salt you added, you don't know how much like cardamom or whatever you added. So by measuring it, you always know, ah, oh, I like that, so I'm gonna replicate that. Right, so um, hi everyone. Um, nice to see uh, uh, some, uh, some cool people watching. Um, I hope, uh, Valentina, this answered your um, French press uh, question. But if someone else has questions about it, uh, let me know. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Boris. Um, I think uh, I, I actually agree with uh, the pan that you use. Um, I will say that uh, having like a really cheap pan and having a really good piece of, for example, salmon, um, you can't make the salmon uh, uh, that much worse. But having a really uh, like, like low quality piece of salmon, so like a, like a deep frozen salmon, for example, if you have a really good pan. It's not going to be uh, instantly amazing because you have a fancy pan. But uh, um, Boris, uh, uh, oh, I'm really glad Valentina that uh, that it was very really helpful. Um, then on to the next question. I uh, I had a question uh, from uh, Andre. And I hope I pronounced your name uh, correctly uh, about water quality. Now um, his question was really specific. I live in the Netherlands. Should I use uh, tap water or bottled water? Now. Um, this, we get this question quite a lot, and there are some people that say, well, um, uh, uh, you know, depending on where, uh, depending on where you live, you get uh, a certain uh, advice. But the water you use for coffee uh, really depends on your, the energy you want to put into it, like how much effort you want to uh, put into it, and how much money you want to put into it. Now, let me first off, right off the bat, say uh, bottled water is, for me, not an amazing uh, use of resources. Because bottled water is uh, expensive if you uh, make coffee regularly, especially if you use it daily. It's impractical because you have a lot of plastic laying around and you have to go to the store quite a lot. And if you want to stack up, you need to like loads of bottles of water. And um, luckily, in bottled water, the, the mineral content is, is on the bottle. Uh, in this video, I'm... Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. I'd like to quickly answer a question by Dennis. Um, he asked which colleagues makes the best amazing jokes, which is obviously uh, Sanne. Uh, Sanne Westphal is my favorite colleague because uh, her jokes, um, um, well, they never make me laugh, but sort of I'm, I'm glad that they make her laugh. Uh, but going on back to water, um, what's important in, in the water quality is that uh, you have certain mineral contents. But these mineral contents, aren't always um, best for each type of water, each brew method, and this video is a little bit too short, or like this questionnaire is a little bit too short to go into that too deep. Also, didn't study any type of chemistry, so uh, I'm really scared that I'm gonna embarrass myself. So, what I will say is that tap water in the Netherlands is generally quite good, um, but that depends on where you are. For example, in Limburg, the, the water is really different from Amsterdam, and really different from Rotterdam, and etc. Uh, there's a couple of things, like for example, uh, Amersfoort has some amazing water, it's pretty soft water, it's a really soft mineral content, so tap water for Amersfoort is generally fine. Um, but Amsterdam can be different because the, the, the hardness isn't uh, super high compared to some other parts in the world, uh, like London for example, uh, or other places, uh, the mountains for example, but um, it has, some, uh, has a lot of nitrate, and um, that sounds like Sounds weird, but there's um, also for me like chemistry is difficult. But there's some lot of lot of nitrate in the water, which makes it sometimes taste a little bit dull. Um, and coming back to uh, what should I do when I have tap water that's sort of good but not quite? Uh, the cheapest way to do it is to buy some uh, is to buy a water jug. Um, I've ordered one online. It hasn't uh, come in yet because I also uh, when I'm not working, I'm also at home. Uh, you know, making more coffee than usual. So 
I um, bought a water jug, which is uh, basically a jug with a water filter inside. Now, most cafes uh, in the Netherlands uh, and everywhere have a water filter. They have to treat the water because for espresso machines and water boilers, um, uh, having good water is, uh, uh, is pretty good, especially for your machine, for the longevity of your machine. So uh, they treat it with commercial water filters. Now, uh, you might have seen one, they're like, they're like big tubes with some, um, um, with, with some beads inside that uh, treat the water. And uh, having that at home is, well, from my opinion, kind of ridiculous instead of, unless you, uh, uh, unless you have, like, a, use a lot of coffee and you have other appliances for it well, or you prefer to drink filtered water, that's absolutely fine. But if you only use it for making coffee, and especially in the Netherlands, uh, uh, I think for, for home use, it's best to just only use it for, uh, uh, for coffee and, and tea, obviously. And um, these jugs will, uh, they have some small filter in it, and the filter will process about 100 liters, like 80 to 100 liters of water. Now the filters cost about like 5 to 8 euros, and um, all of them cost like, for, like can process like uh, uh, 5 to 8, sorry, 80 to 100 liters, and um, uh, they are they're interchangeable, and so you can put multiple filters in multiple different water jugs. And then you have five euros for 100 liters, it's way cheaper than bottled water. And um, to be honest, a lot of bottled water in the Netherlands or some brands are just slightly treated tap water. Um, water is some mineral content and hardens, etc. And there's also some small, like bigger things that are floating around in coffee. Uh, sorry, water, and those things are filtered out, and then it's just tap water, and then they sell it as a brand. So what, um, what you get is really fancy branded tap water, which um, I wouldn't really pay for, especially if I lived uh, in the area where they got that water from. So treating it at home with a jug, I think is the best solution. Now, there are a lot of people, especially in the specialty coffee scene, and a lot of home baristas that like, really want control over the water, because with the water jug, it does an okay job, but um, it isn't like, uh, it's not perfect every single time, and for like an average user, it's, it's 10 times better to getting like tap water, using just regular tap water, but um, uh, uh, for some people, that's not enough. So, there are two solutions. Um, both one of them is expensive and the other one is impractical. Now, the first one is expensive, which is a reverse osmosis filter, an RO filter that you can get for your home, and that um, uh, strips down the water and like rebuilds it with certain uh, with uh, certain mineral content, uh, which is amazing, but also expensive. And uh, especially if you just want to make it for coffee, um, I would not really recommend that um, unless you like have money to spare, and then then it should be fine. Um, and the other way to do it is using um, demineralized water, so like empty water with nothing in it, and then putting some minerals back in. You can do that by buying like, empty water, and there's also some um, <laughs> uh, there's also some um, sort of like sort of micro that can use sparkling mineral water. I um, wouldn't recommend that. Um, and uh, it's for, uh, I have to say, it's for a chemical reason that I can't really explain right now, but I'll ask my colleague and uh, Michael, I'll, I'll get back to you, thank you. Um, but if you have, uh, uh, if you have like the empty water and you remineralize it with your own minerals, there are some companies that have small like bags with water that's perfect for water, uh, for making coffee. Uh, one of them is called uh, third wave water. And then you have empty water, you just throw the sachets inside, you stir, and then you have perfect water for your situation. Um, you can do that by yourself as well, by just buying minerals and then putting that in water, but that's a long hobby because um, it requires a lot of work and a little bit of understanding of how this works and also a little bit of care because if you mess it up, you can, you can even make some dangerous water. So um, I would only recommend that if you really uh, want to go for it and uh, try to make your water as perfect as possible. But for the average home user, there's lots of other things that are wor worth talking about. Um, Andreas asked, uh, where can I get some demineralized water in the, in the Netherlands? Uh, you, can, um, uh, you can order it online and you can, there's some certain stores where you can get it. Um, I'm pretty sure, uh, uh, like, grocery, like not a grocery stores, uh, but um, drug stores uh, also uh, supply it. 
but like going online is your best uh, bet. There's also a specialized jug you can buy, which is called the Zero Water, which has a filter that completely strips down uh, uh, the, uh, the water. I think I would recommend that because it's a little bit more convenient. You can just grab any water and through, put it through your filter instead of ordering uh, online and getting uh, uh, getting a certain, you know, like uh, having a lot of water at home, etc. And especially uh, in these days, um, it can be harder to get to um, because there. Uh, I know the, I know from some uh, coffee specialists that there's a sudden demand for this because a lot of people are staying at home. All right, so um, I had a question from Mean to Bean. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for watching. Um, wondering is what do you think is the best brew method at home? Um, I never try to recommend one thing because I don't know what you like. I don't know what you enjoy. I don't know your situation. I don't know your budget. So it depends. For some, some people only want to drink espresso, so they invest and save up for like a nice espresso machine, a nice coffee grinder, and they make espresso at home. And um, that's really cool. And I uh, actually love espresso, but I don't love espresso at home uh, because I only drink, mostly drink coffee in the weekends. And uh, for me, espresso can be a hustle for like one cup. Uh, and also on the weekends, I like to sit down and like read something. So, right. Um, the method I, the method I like is um, actually not changes as well. I'm sorry if this isn't helpful. Uh, what I use the most is the V60 dripper at home. Is um, And for people that don't know, uh, the V60 is a modernization of the Meletta filter that's been around for like a hundred of years, which is a standard drip filter, uh, but then they reshaped it um, to make the water flow um, better, basically. And um, is this convenient? Uh, you put coffee in, uh, you pre-wet the filter, and then you pour some water over it, and it's kind of hassle-free. I, I like it, but there's other methods that are similar. So Kuhn in the chat uh, says um, that he likes the Chemex, which is also a, a really cool uh, brewing method. It looks really fancy. It's been around since the 50s, so it's also like a proven brew method. And um, I'm too clumsy for Chemexes, so because they're really nice glass things, they're quite expensive as well. And I just break them, and then I have to buy a new one, and uh, that's why I don't have a Chemex, basically. Um, so I like my plastic V60 because it can't really break. Um, uh, but you know, there's some uh, there's some other uh, methods as well. Um, but generally, it doesn't really matter if you have a brewing method at home. Like I said, the first thing is look at your coffee beans you're using. Like get some good coffee beans, and then find something you like. For example, uh, the French press produces a really different kind of coffee than a V60 would and then an AeroPress would. So, in that perspective, um, I like try some of them or, uh, you know, uh, or buy one, see how you like it. For example, there's some other brewing methods that are more convenient to take with you. Uh, there's the AeroPress, which I forgot to put on the table. Uh, maybe some of you have seen it, it's sort of a plastic uh, tube. And Chemex is, oh sorry, uh, Aeropresses are virtually unbreakable. So if you go camping, I would recommend an Aeropress because you can fit it in your backpack and it will, like, it will never be hurt. And most other brewing methods will. Um, so, uh, so that. Um, Boris asks, what's the best brewing method if you want to get cafe quality coffee at home? Well, um, I would say that well, cafe quality is a lot of things, and one of the things is uh, they have really fresh coffee. They have treated water, like I said, and then uh, they do it all day. So baristas do something the entire day, which means that they're quite good at it. So if you really, it's, you think you have really good water, you think you have really good coffee, um, and you're still not satisfied with the results, maybe go to your local cafe and ask them, like, what are you doing? Because I can't really. Um, I can't really, I can't really get it. It's never as good as your place. Uh, so I recommend like talking to your local barista, uh, talking to a shop that you like, uh, and go to them for advice. That's, that's how I learned. It's like going to uh, some of my favorite shops and like asking like, hey, how do you? Sorry, to check if the stream is still working. Um, so we had a cool question, and that was. Um, we had a good question because we asked this question with our family and friends and uh, one of the questions was what is the pineapple pizza equivalent for coffee? Which I thought was a really cool one because pineapple pizza is um, uh, funnily enough uh, sort of a 
heated food item. So some people really like it and some people don't and there don't seem to be people in the middle ground. Uh, I think there are people in the middle ground that sometimes like it or don't, but like, you know, they're not really vocal. Uh, but the people that really don't like it is because they, their argument is mostly you shouldn't do that to pizza. And people that do like it are, yeah, but it tastes good. And this is a really important distinction because in coffee we have sort of the same thing. And I would say that it's flavored milk drinks. Um, a lot of people in the coffee scene can be um, uh, not really um, understanding of people that use, uh, that, that drink and enjoy flavored milk drinks because it, uh, well, it alters the flavor. So if you have a coffee that, that, that tastes a certain way and you add flavoring, it will taste like that flavoring. Like you would like use ketchup with food or mustard and that kind of stuff. It would mostly taste like that item and not like the item you had to begin with. And a lot of people in the coffee industry uh, have, have worked really hard to, to tell a story of quality, that the, the inherent quality of the coffee itself is most important. But um, there's loads of people that drink coffee, like, like loads, like loads and loads of people drink coffee. And not everyone is in the same boat quality-wise. Um, sounds weird to admit it, but there are some food items that I also probably don't have the highest quality uh, at home. Uh, because, you know, everyone does groceries at the supermarket and for some items you go to a specialized store, but, you know, not everyone can afford the best version of anything. And honestly, you know, a caramel latte is, is really good. It's like having a small dessert. Uh, I don't want it all the time because I don't have a really large sweet tooth, so I prefer savory items. Um, but if you really enjoy that, like, that's fine. It's absolutely fine and, and go for it. And like some people started to drink coffee by adding stuff to it to make it a little bit less bitter uh, because no one started with a drinking uh, single origin high quality coffee so in that perspective um, you know enjoy caramel latte I think is, is, is pineapple pizza um, it because I'm a huge fan of pineapple pizza because the taste is amazing um, uh, well I'm mostly vegetarian so that I don't need to eat it with uh, regularly with, uh, with ham but the combination of something salty with something uh, sour and sweet, which is obviously the, 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 the pineapple, is pretty good because a lot of really complex food have a combination of all the flavors. And um, uh, coffee can be sweet, but you know, it's not as sweet as a caramel latte. And uh, a lot of desserts, for example, in restaurants added a lot of sugars and every, everything that's a cake, you add a lot of sugar. Uh, because just eating flour and egg isn't like super delicious, no matter how good the flour and the eggs are. So I think we should just drop it and have everyone drink caramel latte from time to time and be super upon, upon, um, unapologetic, that's a hard word, unapologetic about it and just say, you know, I like caramel lattes or hazelnut, whatever you enjoy. And um, funny enough, you know, um, Monet, the, the company that produces most syrups, has a buttload of flavors, so you can add like Violet, and I even some someone made me like a like a basil latte, which is interesting. It tastes a bit like pizza because it tastes like like basil. Um, so you know you can go crazy. And um, continuing on this, there's uh, barista competitions that uh, have a standard element of uh, making sort of a special drink, and uh, the special drink is usually something with coffee, something sweet, and something interesting like a fruit. Uh, concentration or, or something fresh but that's basically adding something sugary to something that is super not sugary um, so Salas what's my favorite drink um, depends on when you ask me so I would definitely be down for caramel letter sometimes sad let's, let's have one um, but usually I drink filter coffee uh, on the other hand when I'm working I like espresso because it's small it's quick and you're done uh, because I usually enjoy filter coffee and um, I know, I don't have this uh, favorite thing, so surprise me. Um, Andre asked, what do you think about espresso with orange juice? Well, uh, should be good. Uh, I tried to make a, a granita out of uh, orange juice and coffee ones. That wasn't particularly uh, successful because the coffee I used was not really good. Um, uh, this was like back in the day when I was uh, uh, not using amazing coffee. Uh, so. Yeah, with a nice espresso, orange juice, 
could be really good. Um, I don't think all coffees fare uh, amazing uh, and orange juice can vary. Orange is also complicated because uh, sometimes in supermarkets you have um, really sour and sometimes really sweet um, um, orange juice. So if you have like sweet orange juice, I think that would be, be amazing. Try it, let me know what you thought. Um, I'm gonna um, answer Boris later because Boris asks a lot of questions. Um, uh, bup, 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 bup. Let's see, Andre asked, uh, I have the jasmine tea like Ethiopian ones. Do you have one that, that has a taste note? We, um, thank you for your question. That's um, actually um, with my, uh, uh, oh, Andre, I'm glad you like your espresso with orange juice. Um, type the recipe, I wanna try it. So let me know what you do, which kind of coffee you make. Um, and Andre, um, you probably had a Yerkshev Ethiopian coffee, which is a certain region in Ethiopia, which produces really tea-like uh, beverages, uh, like the coffees. So jasmine, uh, black tea, is actually one of my favorite uh, regions to get coffee from, especially when you get a, a really high quality, because those coffees are super, super smooth and sweet. Uh, we don't have a Yerkeshev right now. We had one for Christmas. Um, we try to have a Yerkeshev like every year, uh, but you know, there's a whole world of amazing coffees. So uh, we we have some amazing Kenyan coffees right now. We have a delicious coffee from uh, a different region, uh, from different farm. Uh, in Ethiopia right now called Sukukuto and their unwashed coffee is also really smooth. It's not exactly tea-like but it has like the fruity smoothness that you probably uh, enjoy. And um, yeah, just keep, keep track of our web website and uh, let me know, you know if, you, if you're interested in, in trying different coffees like that. Um, but if you want to know uh, what the name is, it's probably Yergeshev. Um, all right, so um, I had a, uh, another question uh, that I was, thought was interesting. Um, I asked my sister and my sister asked me, why do coffee taste different? Which is a really long question, a little bit too long maybe to answer uh, right now, but there's a really short answer. Um, generally people, uh, when they sort of discover that coffee has more flavors, they're surprised by it because coffee is generally sold as one flavor and not a lot of uh, different ones. So um, when um, you try that, you're confused because like some other products that you thought, you know, taste like one thing and suddenly can taste like other things can be a little bit weird. But coffee has like a lot of different uh, uh, flavors. I've tasted coffees that like, like I said, taste like tea. I've tasted olives and tomatoes and lots of different things in coffee. And I think that's amazing because there's other products like wine where it's really common that wine can taste like anything. Uh, we don't, uh, funny enough, coffee has, a lot of coffee producers uh, put the flavor description on the back. So here, uh, our Ethiopian uh, year-round coffee has a peach, floral, and bright on the back. Um, but why doesn't? Wine just says where it came from with a label and the, the, the grape uh, variety that, it, that is on it. But Sometimes nothing. Some bottles just say slurp, and then people are like, "Oh yeah, I like that." But they'll accept that it can be really different from other from other um, from other wines. Coffee is not really uh, um, uh, different. It's mostly uh, well, it's like Joachim says in the, in the chat. He's a, he's a really knowledgeable young man. He seems, he seems he I think he knows a lot about coffee, is uh, or agriculture in general. Is that the variety of the coffee is really important uh, the processing method is like how is it produced there's different types of doing that uh, loads of different types uh, uh, actually and uh, there is the amount of care that the farmer puts in it's kind of sounds like a TLC vague thing but how do you often wash your things uh, how quickly do you pick and then you process it you know the, the, the more attention you put into it the better thing the other things uh, uh, become just like um, with a lot of things. And uh, so I said variety is really important, processing, how much care you put in, but like the amount of sun, the amount of water, there's loads of things that, uh, that determine it, this. And uh, the difficult part for consumers is that um, you don't know what you're getting. When you see a bag of this, it's, um, you don't really know its quality and that's hard for a lot of products. And in the supermarket, we've, we've, uh, we've bought so many products over the years that we kind of know which brands we like we kind of know what to look out for. But when you go outside the supermarket and you encounter smaller brands that you've never heard of, it's hard to tell the difference. 
Um, in, I think usually price is a good indicator that like if you, something is a little bit of a higher price, uh, they're like usually with smaller companies, that's for a reason. Um, so if you buy a bag that you know nothing about and it's like more expensive than the supermarket, well, you can sort of assume that it has higher quality. It's not always the case, so I'm not promising anything. But in my experience, and especially coffee mostly, and then um, when you buy coffee, um, our coffee has a small QR code on top. Mm, it's hard to see, it's a QR code. If you scan that QR code, you go to our website and we provide you with all the information you need. Like I said, the variety, um, where it came from, the sub-region, and um, you can email us with any information that you like, you know, uh, when, you, when was it harvested, kind of uh, details like that. And um, if a company knows those details, it's probably uh, the, the um, uh, <laughs> thank you. You, know, you, can, you can Google it next time, yeah. Um, uh, so that comes to why it's different, uh, uh, different flavors. Um, sound a little, little bit rambly, but like the, the, clearest, and, and the clearest explanation is that Apple in supermarkets has, like there's 10, 15 different apples in supermarkets. And everyone knows if I'm baking this, I'm using for example, a uh, golden delicious. If I'm using like a, uh, like a juice that I want some more acidity, I'm going to make take a Granny Smith. Everyone knows that. So coffee is exactly the same. Uh, you just sort of have to get, get to know it and also uh, taste some things. So Julie, I would uh, invite you to come to a store, drink some coffee, and uh, we can like check out some different things and say uh, uh, this tastes like this and this tastes like that. But for one certain coffee, it's hard to say why, because that's biology. Um, let's see if there were more questions. Kuhn asks, what's the main thing you need to pay attention to to buy coffee? I already um, go, uh, went over it a little bit. Um, I think the main reason is that uh, you check for freshness and other details. Like uh, freshness is on the back, so our, this bag has a roast date of the 9th of April 2020, and that's, um, well, 10 days ago, so that's pretty fresh. Um, and when a bag doesn't have dates on it, you have no idea how old it is, like, no idea. So, yeah, um, could be really old, uh, especially pre-ground coffee in the supermarket, probably doesn't have dates on it, so it's maybe super old. Um, so if the bag has a roast date, that's a really good indication that, uh, that the quality is, uh, is, is pretty high. Um, some companies put a uh, best before date and I don't really like that because um, usually that best before date is like six or six months or a year after the roast date, but you don't know that. So best before, uh, coffee doesn't spoil. You can just, I can keep this for 40 years and um, still make coffee out of it. No idea if that's going to be good, but still. It doesn't spoil it, what made me sick. Um, so uh, it doesn't need it doesn't need a best before date. So if someone uses the best before date, I can be um, um, uh, yeah, it's kind of hard to just to, to know when they roasted it. So knowing when someone roasted it is a really good uh, uh, really good indication. Um, another indication is the details. What do you know about this particular coffee? Um, People that work in the specialty coffee scene, like myself uh, and some other roasters, uh, I'm not a roaster, but um, uh, some other roasting companies that uh, we call themselves the specialty coffee uh, scene, where we try to focus mostly on quality and transparency. Uh, the quality is because we want coffee to taste delicious, and transparency is because we want uh, our customers to know what we're doing and why. So we uh, tell boring details like how high this coffee was grown, um, to go a little bit back to Julie's question, like, um, like my sister's question, um, uh, is that um, altitude has a little bit to do with quality, not everything, but a little bit. Um, so knowing the altitude, knowing that the roaster knows where their coffee comes from, is also a sort of, sort of a promise of uh, uh, quality. However, it also could be a gimmick as well. I've seen packaging that says, our product is from this and this region, but that didn't give me anything, uh, um, yeah, any information, or it didn't make uh, more clear to me that the producer knew what they were doing. Um, I saw one product that had um, oranges that came from India, the, the country of India, which is, you know, pretty big. So no idea where that com comes from. 
Um, let's see. Um, we had some other. Um, let's see if I missed any uh, uh, questions. Um, Bor says, like, what's your best food recipe with coffee in it? Um, actually, I uh, I found this cool recipe uh, for um, making a, a rub around food. Uh, so uh, generally meat, like I cook mostly with vegetables, uh, but with meat you can make a rub by uh, putting like mustard and seeds and pepper uh, around the meat and you sort of like, let it marinate in a bit and you bake it in that um, and then it will acquire different tastes. And the, um, in, uh, so what I, what I found is a recipe where you have ground coffee that you mix with like mustard and, uh, and other types of seed and then you rub that around something. I use cauliflower, so like a big, like, like a, like a big sort of steak of cauliflower and a rubbed coffee with mustard and a bit of honey and some pepper and salt all around it. I let it sit for a little bit and then I bake that. And you might think, ooh, the coffee is probably gonna be really like roasty and, and like bitter and charcoaly, like you would ex like expect because uh, coffee that's roasted really dark can taste like that. But actually it didn't um, because there was a lot of other things that were getting hot, so it wasn't actually roasting at the degree that would make it um, not very really good, that disgusting, but it actually tasted really good. The, the coffee retained most of its flavor. Coffee, uh, ground coffee, if you taste it, uh, it has some acidity, it has some flavor, by far not the same as a, 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 as a brewed cup of coffee, but it has some flavors, intricate flavors of the bean. Um, so, um, I really like that because it sort of had this acidic, interesting, roasty, malty uh, flavor, so I quite like that. So Boris, um, try it out. I, uh, I know you're a big uh, cooking person and um, maybe I'll, uh, if you're lucky, I'll cook it for you sometimes when we're allowed to uh, social distance uh, less. Right, um, so uh, I, um, we do a lot of coffee courses here. I'm uh, mostly a coffee educator, uh, a trainer, and um, my, I have some colleagues for, for that as well. And uh, we do a lot of courses. Uh, and during these courses, there's a lot of questions that come up uh, by people and I thought uh, the, the question that sort of gets the most attraction is mostly like, what is a latte? What is a cappuccino? How does that work? Um, and I thought I'd go into that really briefly because I know that people can be confused about it. So, um, first off, let me say that uh, coffee is food and food doesn't have rules. There's like I said earlier with the pineapple pizza, there's people that think food should have rules uh, but a lot of uh, um, people uh, um, don't have rules because it's food. You can do whatever you want with it. You can make like like Andre does uh, espresso with orange juice, and it'll be fine. You can also do an espresso and tomato juice. I tried coffee and tomato juice; it was amazing. So you know you can do anything with it. So using that as uh, a reference, I um, I like to say that coffee is mostly um, like. Brown water, so it's it's coffee. It's, 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 it's coffee, no matter how you like it, uh, weak, strong, uh, jasmine or or bitter, it doesn't matter. And then you can add anything you want, mostly milk uh, to make. Uh, originally, we started adding like historically, we started adding milk to make it uh, less bitter. But um, it's also really good, you know. Milk is 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 sweet and it's it's creamy. So adding that to coffee is a great idea. So. Um, you get coffee, black, and coffee with milk, and then you can add more milk to um, dilute the espresso or the, the filter coffee, however you use it, to make the flavor of coffee less prominent, like you would dilute anything. And um, how, to, how, that, how that goes with uh, a cappuccino and flat white, etc., is that um, there's not one of them which is true because there's a lot of places that have preferences like cultural preferences uh, or mostly cultural preferences and sometimes uh, preferences which align with their menu or uh, um, actually it's mostly cultural preferences because uh, for example um, the flat white is a great example flat white uh, came from australia and new zealand and the place uh, where it came from um, right now does it different internally uh, within uh, places but originally the flat white was in an era when uh, espresso machines came with Italian immigrants to 
trainer. And what happened is that uh, espresso machines produced foam. So you could have a foamy milk drink. And the Australian coffee scene didn't have that. So um, one anecdote that I read was that there would be signs outside cafes that says flat whites only to um, as a communication that they didn't have an espresso machine so they couldn't make the cappuccino bold, big and frothy they can only just add some milk uh, flat refers to the fact that it's you know flat and white just has milk um, white coffee in, in also in America just has milk added. so a flat white was probably originally just coffee with some milk now these days we also foam um, uh, we also foam our uh, coffees, but the foam is usually flat. There's some places that still have like really big foam. Uh, sometimes it puts like some nice uh, cocoa sprinkles on top. Um, so the foam is flat, but there's still foam. So even if you have like two, three centimeters of foam, it's still flat. So is that a flat white? Well, no, it depends on who you ask. Uh, a lot of people when you say in the Netherlands ask what is flat white, they'll probably say something like two shots. But some place in Australia, it's one shot. And some place in Australia says it has to be with a ristretto. Now, ristretto is a whole different story, so I'll save that for uh, another time or after this, if we have some time. Um, so, um, the flat white is something different in the place where it came from than here. But we imported it. So, uh, we, st we started to... Uh, 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 Oh, hi Caroline, really nice to see you. Um, I'll get to your question in a second. So to, um, to sort of sum up, what is a flat white? I don't know, it's just coffee with some milk and I'm just asked the place that you go to, how they make it and if, see if you like that. Like I said, coffee is food. So if you order like a pizza somewhere, you're not, you don't know if it's gonna be good because a lot of pizzas are different even if they have the same like a margarita, it can be mozzarella, it can be gouda, it can be oregano, that kind of stuff. So just go to your Rista and like I said in the very beginning, sorry to keep repeating this, but it's really important. The type of coffee they use is really important. If they have nice fresh milk, I think that's more important than having this amount and that amount of milk. And you know, other than that, uh, please everyone, if you enjoy something, that's amazing, keep enjoying it. Um, Caroline had a really cool question. Uh, she asked, can you share some new trends, innovations in coffee that you're excited about? Well, honestly, I'm excited about a lot of things. Um, um, what I really like is uh, there is, I saw a new espresso machine or more a proof of concept espresso machine that didn't have a boiler. Now this technology has been around for a while. It uses a thermal block to uh, instantly heat cold or colder water uh, to produce the temperature that is usually used for uh, making espresso, uh, but it requires way less uh, energy. And it's also smaller because espresso machines are cool, but most of them are really chunky. So having big chunky units on your bar, for me, kind of feels like we could be more efficient because there's a lot of things in, in innovation that uh, streamline their, their machines. So, you know, espresso machines, I'm sorry, I'm, they're especially right there, so that's why I'm looking at it. Um, so having smaller espresso machines excites me uh, a lot. Um, I'll try to think of some more, if I can think of more, uh, Caroline. Um, do you ship to France? Um, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, we ship to lots of places. Uh, I think it's not shipping even. I think it's, it's, it's by, uh, uh, by, um, cargo. Well, cargo, you know, like, what do you call these things? Vachtwagen. Lorry. Thank you. Um, so yes, uh, uh, thank you for liking our coffee. Um, I'm really happy. Uh, we try really hard to make it, to keep it that way. So thank you. Uh, let me know which one you think is, uh, is the most delicious. Um, and, uh, Caroline, let me go back to you. Um, trends, innovations. Uh, I kind of like that, uh, to go back to the, uh, to, to different drinks. I do see that, that, the, uh, like the strictness of using like black only and you know having uh, really specific kind of drinks is uh, there's like more places experimenting with different kinds of drinks and I saw that not only in uh, uh, like like specialty shops or like really fancy shops but also in bigger catering companies that were experimenting with having different types of coffee drink uh, because coffee is an amazing healthy uh, alternative to sodas especially uh, highly caffeinated sodas 
uh, those are generally not really healthy if you drink them in the same uh, amount that you, you, know, you drink coffee. So coffee, you know, it's just, especially if you have filter coffee, it's just mostly water, so it's pretty healthy. Um, so there's new trends to sort of try to shape it up, uh, try to uh, get creative with flavors and uh, people aren't scared to put uh, different things into their coffees to make them taste a certain way. So um, I'm, I'm a big fan of that. I obviously like to be surprised and um, I like to uh, yeah, try new things. And this, uh, I, I tried, I, I had some really good things at places that I didn't expect. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of that. Um, if there's other things, um, I kind of like uh, in like a trend innovation thing. I kind of like, and this is kind of a maybe it sounds weird, but like we work with um, sorry, um, mm -hmm, yeah, um, we work with a lot of uh, cafes and restaurants, and I kind of like that people are embracing uh, things that make our workflow easier. So uh, there's a couple of tools. Uh, being a barista can be hard. It can be straining uh, for your back, uh, for your wrist, uh, for your mental health because you know you have to smile all day, and uh, you know that can be like mentally straining. But there are things that make it less straining for your body, um, and I'm uh, I'm pretty I'm really enthusiastic that uh, a lot of people are embracing that to make to make making coffee more fun and more easy for the barista. Uh, there are some people that are fighting back that think like coffee should be. Sorry, we're almost out of battery, so um, that's why I pressed away. Um, uh, uh, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, um, so I get people embracing automation. Right, um, cool, thank you for the recommendation, um, Dreams. I will, uh, uh, I will pick up on that, thank you. Um, we thought this looked prettier, but uh, you're right, that could be more convenient. Um, Rose says, are you a fan of non-dairy milks? What's your favorite? That's a great question. Um, I don't really have one favorite. Uh, we, I, there's one brand called Minor Figures that I quite like because the, uh, the oats, uh, it is, it's an oat milk uh, and its flavor is very neutral. And I like that because it's very neutral. Uh, but like Oatly is, is pretty good. It, uh, it does the job. It's, uh, um, especially to work with for, for baristas, it's amazing. Um, then the, we, uh, we, in the shop here, we use a type of uh, soy milk called bonsoi, uh, which I quite like if you steam it well. Um, uh, it's, it's really nice texture. And I also have to say, um, I don't know because I haven't tried them all. Uh, especially the Dutch market is fairly uh, limited when it comes to uh, milk alternative. There's plenty in the supermarket, but for the cafe scene, um, uh, like comparing to other international scenes, we're a little bit slow to catch on uh, because the amount of people that ask for non-dairy is, is smaller than, for example, Mel uh, uh, markets like uh, California or, or Melbourne, Australia in general. And so therefore, the amount of products that are available are, are like a lot more. And um, I've read some really good reviews about some of these brands and I would really like to try them. Uh, so I try to come across as many as possible. Um, Glad that you're asking, nobody asked this, but I want to say this, what is my least favorite uh, alternative milk? Um, this is kind of hard to ask, answer because um, this is made with coffee. So just drinking it um, is something different. But my uh, absolutely least favorite alternative milk was a hennep milk that I tried a couple of years ago that basically tastes like you're drinking a plant, which I wasn't a huge fan of. Um, and together with milk, it was not really pleasant tasting. Um, however, in the meanwhile, I've had one that was pretty good. So, um, you know, brands keep surprising me. Uh, it's not the one thing, so it's not, it's not like almond or whatever isn't good. It's what the brand does with it and how it mixes with coffee. So I can't really say that there's one thing that's my favorite. Let me see, uh, Hill asked, do you have a favorite brand of usual takeaway cups? Some cups give this metal taste which I don't really like. You're, uh, ah, thank you, Hilda. Uh, I tried really hard. It only took me like 15 minutes, but I, you know, I can teach you if you want. Um, um, right, so takeaway cups are, uh, I kind of have like an issue with takeaway cups because uh, there's basically two categories. One of them, which doesn't leak, which is a thermos can, 
which I like for filter coffee on the go because it doesn't leak. So you can just throw it in your car, backpack or whatever and just drink it in the bar. You usually come with a nice mug to drink it from. So I'm kind of fine like that, but then the mug's kind of dirty. And then the second category, Gory, is everything that looks like a mug and most of them leak. Like almost all of them leak some degree of coffee. And walking, um, you know, I'm just going to use this for example, like walking like this. I don't walk like this, but like, you know, you walk. Um, it sort of spills out and then um, anything that you have or your clothing or your hand or your trousers can get uh, dirty and um, you know depending on where you go uh, going could be an important meeting so it's really inconvenient if your coffee cup is leaking um, so uh, well if you don't like the the, the metal uh, uh, taste you could probably uh, go for something like bamboo there's a uh, there's a new company I forgot the name I have I have one at home um, a company that the, um, has bamboo uh, material all around and it uh, retains uh, heat pretty well as well so I'm a fan of those um, the lids you know like if you walk pretty you know if you're catching a train it's, it's inconvenient but if you walk normally it should be fine also don't fill it all the way up to the, to the rim um, my newest favorite one is uh, we'll call it one from Mir, but unfortunately it's not available in the US. Uh, my sister really kindly brought it from Stumptown Coffee Roasters in in uh, US, but I know more brands work with them. They're called uh, Mir, I think M I I R, and uh, it's a stainless steel double walled mug um, with a lid, and the lid works really well. Um, and it's a mug, and I love mugs. I don't like that the takeaway thing don't have. I like um, like a handle because I love the handles, but that's just I mean per personally. And that was a met metal coating inside, but it didn't give me a metal taste. Uh, but thank you for the question. Um, Karina asks, are there anything new or interesting roast drinks coming on the menu? Our menu. Ooh, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about about this. I know uh, like I know some of the baristas have been working really hard to try some. Um, new coffee drinks uh, for spring and summer. Uh, I'm not sure if they're finished, so um, I'm probably going to say too much about it because someone might say, hey, uh, we're trying to make that a good entrance. Uh, we have, uh, the, in terms of coffee and roast that we've been buying, um, we uh, our, uh, our boss and founder uh, and owner, Menno, uh, he, uh, he has done some trials with fermentation in uh, Kenya and in uh, Cape Verde in, in Togo and I've tasted one of these coffees and the results were pretty amazing it's a it's a processing method called carbonic uh, maceration and um, yeah it was interesting it's a sort of processing method that we can talk about uh, for another time it's a little bit it's long and it's a chemical story so um, that's interesting um, because we have the Kenyan coffees and you can try them. We have so we have two different screen sizes, like how big the beans are. Those have a different flavor, and then you can also have a different processing method with those two, and they all four have different flavors. So I'm really excited to try those uh, side by side. I mean, I have tasted them individually, uh, but not like side by side. So that would be really interesting. Julie should come to taste this. Um, and those ask, do you have a coffee bucket list? Um, Yes, obviously. Uh, I really want to go to uh, Supercuto, which is one of the coffee farms we've been working with for a long time. I've met uh, the uh, owner, who is also an agron agronomist, and Tesfai, and he's an amazing human being, so I'd love to like, see his farm uh, in, 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 in life. Um, and, well, you know, Melbourne, I've heard good things. There's some good things in Melbourne, I would see. I recently saw a video that in Jakarta that was uh, looked really good. So, uh, so yeah, those are like new places with new scenes always surprise me. So, uh, looking forward to that. I'm just gonna wrap this all up, uh, Carolina. You definitely need to come back to Amsterdam because we miss you. Um, so, thank you all for watching. Uh, thank you for the questions, Boris. I will uh, copy your um, <laughs> question later. Um, Ethiopian. Cold brew is for boars in the morning. Um, we're gonna wrap it up. Thank you very much for watching. Um, I had fun. Uh, thank you for uh, tuning in. Um, oh, like one question: Are bottles and cuppings open to public? Uh, last question: um, Yes, we don't obviously don't have one some plan right now. Uh, we've like done so in the past. So uh, when 
all of this uh, goes back to normal, uh, our normal day life, we'll definitely look into that. But cupping right now is a huge health concern, so we're not doing that. Thank you very much for watching, thank you for all your questions. Uh, we want to do a, a new broadcast as well, maybe we'll do a themed one as well. And if you have any more questions, uh, please write them to workshop at bocca.nl. Um, that's my email address, so uh, I can answer them. And if I didn't answer questions in depth enough, uh, let me know. I had a lot of fun, and um, yeah, see you next time. Uh, I'm getting some help. <laughs>